This podcast is brought to you by the School of Advanced Study, University of London. Um, and I'm not referring in detail to all these texts, but uh, one of the things I wanted to do was just point across to some different texts that might be of interest um, to, to people working on these kinds of questions and themes, and different people might want to follow up different different texts from this, this list. And I'll just gesture towards them as I go, but I'm not going to do any in-depth um, references. Okay. Um, thanks to Jill for inviting me to be, to be part of, of today, and thank you to our three panelists, Anna in her absence, for their, their papers, which I had the pleasure of getting about a week in advance. So I've had time to read them and, and think about them, which, is, which has been a real pleasure and, and, and a privilege. So thank you. Thank you. Um, it was really hard to try and limit this to about 10 minutes. I'll do my best. I might run over a little bit, but there's so much in all three papers. Um, just before I say a little bit about each paper, I, I want to just situate my response a bit so you know where I'm coming from. My background's in philosophy, um, including philosophy and literature, and also with a particular interest in feminist philosophy and feminist theory. And I'm especially interested in sort of a mode of philosophizing that has come to be referred to often as feminist philosophies of difference, and that would include thinkers like Luisa Rigori, uh, the Italian feminist philosopher Adriana Cavarero. Um, in this country, Christine Battersby's work has been crucial in this field as well. And I'm also particularly interested in the way that in, in recent years, there's been an increasingly strong turn in feminist philosophy to thinking about specifically the philosophical significance of birth. And there's really been a kind of explosion of texts actually in this field in the, in the last few years. All three thinkers that I've just mentioned have been crucial in that field. Um, and in some ways, as is always the case in feminist philosophy, we can take de Beauvoir as a kind of figure in the background in relation to whom and to some extent against whom these figures are writing. Um, Beauvoir famously in The Second Sex describes pregnancy as being tenanted by an alien within and doesn't offer the most hopeful resources for thinking about pregnancy and, and, and can't really think motherhood as, a, as an existential project, for example. Thinkers like Rigori have argued that the the position of woman as other within a patriarchal culture can't be rethought without also rethinking the position of the mother and the significance of our beginnings in birth. Adriana Cavarero has argued that the Western philosophical tradition has taken mortality and death as its horizon rather than natality and birth and it challenges us to reorient our thinking in relation to birth. Christine Battersby has argued that by taking the female body that births as a norm rather than seeing it as a kind of weird exception as it's often positioned in relation to the, model, the modern model of the autonomous self-contained subject, that taking the female body that births as a norm allows us to generate an account of the self as both fleshy and bodily and bound up with otherness in ways that give us quite a distinct alternative to the dominant modern ideal of the autonomous disembodied self-contained subject. So those are the kinds of theoretical backgrounds, and I've put some of the, the key thinkers and texts I'm referring to up there if you want to follow them up afterwards, if that's helpful. Recent work has also, I think, shown an increased emphasis on the ways in which the, the practice and preoccupations of philosophy would change if it paid more attention, not just to the experiences and perspectives of women, but specifically the experiences of mothers. Here, the, the work of Iris Marion Young, her book... Um, on female bodily experience was a key text here in, in getting philosophers, feminist philosophers at least, um, to start rethinking um, birth and, and pregnant embodiment. And there's also been a number of really interesting recent texts. For example, um, a book by Alison Stone, um, which, yeah, Feminism, Psychoanalysis and Maternal Subjectivity, which came out last year. Um, and I'll refer back to that later on. And a collection edited by Sheila Lintot and Maureen Sanders Stout, Philosophical Inquiries into Pregnancy, Childbirth and Mothering, which is really a wide-ranging collection of essays across a whole range of different subjects, um, some of which include the relationship of contemporary mothering to questions of spirituality and religion. So... These, these, this is sort of just a very quick sketch of the kinds of texts and some of the issues that are shaping a really um, 
kind of exciting field, growing field in, in philosophy and feminist philosophy that's taking questions of birth, pregnancy, motherhood seriously. And for me, what was exciting about reading all three papers that we've heard this morning is precisely that they show what enormously rich resources there are um, to be found in this kind of sustained and nuanced thinking about the experiences, perspe perspectives, and perceptions of motherhood, as well as their cultural mediation in literature. And it's obviously impossible to do justice to what we've heard in a few minutes, but I'll try and say something about each of the papers. Um, starting with Sheridan's paper, um, in, in which Sheridan argues very persuasively that in the, the text she's considering, the disappointments of motherhood from both the perspective of mothers and their children are bound up with the disappointments in a God that has failed us. This religious disappointment could be glossed philosophically by borrowing Nietzsche's notion of the death of God, as well as Lyotard's analysis of the collapse of meta-narratives that anchor modern understandings of the world, epitomized again by a collapse of faith in a kind of transcendent, omnipotent deity who could guarantee order and meaning. One thing that I found really intriguing and thought-provoking about Sheridan's paper was that it produces a kind of perspectival shift because it made me think about what's now a very familiar narrative of the 20th century, at least in, in sort of philosophical and theoretical terms, this notion that there's a kind of crisis of modernity, um, a crisis of the subject. And it, it made me think about how that specific crisis of modernity might be reappraised if we thought it through from the perspective of the experience of mothers and how the collapse of faith, the apparent abandonment of humanity by an all-powerful deity, might be linked specifically to mothers' experiences as of a, of a crisis in maternity alongside and informing this crisis in modernity. In Western modern philosophy, for example, the, the Holocaust, which is very important for one of the, the novels, as a context, one of the novels that, that you were talking about, has been and continues to be positioned as a kind of paradigmatic event for a radical breakdown of Enlightenment values that pose a fundamental challenge to modern conceptions of the ethical and the political. And Sheridan's discussion of Ursula Krechel's novel made me wonder what would happen if we approached the Holocaust not just as a collapse of Enlightenment humanist values, but more specifically as a kind of terrible betrayal of maternity and of the values that are embodied in maternity, of the mother's power to generate, of the potential given within each single human being as birthed, and of the genealogical relations between mothers and their children. On the kind of analysis that um, the feminist philosopher Lucy Rigori has provided, it, it's perhaps unsurprising that the death of God should be bound up with a crisis in maternal subjectivity, and indeed that as came across in some of the, the characterizations you gave of God in these novels, that, that God should come to appear as a kind of bad mother, absent and inattentive and forgetful. On a rigorized account, the, the projection of a monotheistic male deity as a creator of the world and a source of human existence stems from man's need to displace maternal generative power and repress his beginnings in birth. And in her own extended engagement with Nietzsche, Irigaray suggests that his confrontation with the death of God is actually a missed opportunity to reconsider our beginnings in birth. So she suggests that, that for Nietzsche, in the face of this sort of void left by the death of God, which your writers are also confronting, the individual has, is faced with the challenge of becoming the source of their own values and with the task of affirming everything that has made them who they are. Um, most famously in the kind of thought of the eternal return. Could you will everything that has made you who you are to return again eternally without any change? And a rigorized challenge to Nietzsche is that what this forgets is that there is still one crucial aspect of every individual's existence that they cannot simply will into existence themselves, and that is their, their own birth, that their very coming into the world involves a dependency on another, not a transcendent other anymore, not a transcendent deity, but a fleshy singular other, the, the mother from whom we're each born. And I think here Irigaray perhaps also points to a, a difference or a dissymmetry between the kinds of disappointment we might feel in relation to the notion of the death of God and those that arise in relation to maternity. Both kinds of disappointment involve a fallen idol or a collapsed ideal, whether that's the ideal of impossibly attainable perfect motherhood or um, a transcendent deity. But whereas the death of God leaves us facing existence in the absence of a transcendent uh, overarching power, the collapse of the impossible ideal of perfect motherhood 
painful though it may be, opens the way to rethinking or reevaluating our relation to motherhood as the actual condition of our existence and, and embodied in very specific lived relations. A key aspect of this rethinking, as, as all the papers have brought out in different ways, must be to readdress the ambivalence, pain, and loss that, that is an intrinsic part of motherhood and inextricably bound up with its potential pleasures and joys. And the work of Lisa Barrett's, uh, Lisa Barrett's and Maternal Encounters, The Ethics of Interruption, and also Alison Stone's book, Feminism, Psychoanalysis, and Maternal Subjectivity, are both, are both really um, helpful here because of the way that they foreground ambivalence as a central part of the experience of mothering and not necessarily as a negative aspect of mothering but as a generative, transformative and, and difficult but potentially productive aspect of mothering. So what I'm, what I'm suggesting here, and I think this, this connects to some extent to the end of Sheridan's paper where she talks about um, turning to the notion of, of love as a way of thinking through the, uh, the ways we inhabit the world, the ways we relate to others in the absence of God and in the face of maternal disappointment. In keeping with that thought, but perhaps somewhat in contrast to, to Simon Critchley's emphasis on a kind of collective faithlessness, I'm suggesting we might look specifically to the relational and embodied side of maternal relations as a model of a non-idealizing love that encompasses human beings in their messy, fleshy vulnerability and with all the ambivalences and asymmetries that characterize motherhood and dependency. Um, inevitably, I'm not gonna have time to say much more um, about the other two papers without going horribly over time. So I, did have, I do have some thoughts on Anna's paper, but as Anna wasn't able to be here, I think I'll turn to Syria's paper um, and I'll perhaps feed in comments on Anna's paper in, in discussion. Um, one of the things that both Anna's and Sheridan's paper brought out very powerfully is the way that motherhood operates as a site of contestation, both within individual mothers' lives and as a site where powerful cultural, ethical, and political ideals come into question. This makes motherhood also a site with tremendous transformative potential for both individuals and at a cultural and social level. And I think this potential is also very much foregrounded in Saria's paper on the experiences of Muslim mothers in Britain. For me, it was very striking and helpful um, to read and hear of the very different histories and narratives of motherhood that characterize the Muslim tradition, and your, your point that labor is not denigrated as punishment, and, and the absence of that whole narrative about original sin, for example, is, is, is very striking in contrast to the, the dominant Christian tradition. Um, and also then the way that alongside that specific, more patriarchal interpretations of fundamental texts have nonetheless gone on to bolster ideas of maternity that are, that are limiting in ways that point to kind of shared experiences, cross-cultural experiences of women's um, containment and oppression in different kinds of ways. For me, as obviously um, a, a white, pretty much middle-class white, non-Muslim Western woman, what was really valuable about Syria's approach, and it was great to see the, the videos today as well as read the paper, <laughs> it was because of the way that she enables me as a white non-Muslim Western woman to hear, listen to women whose voices I might not otherwise readily hear. And also as a reminder that before we um, wade in to try and offer solutions to women's oppression, um, we always need to listen to the voices of women who do not entirely share our standpoint and might have different perspectives and indeed different solutions to share. As many thinkers have noted, the problem is not just that philosophy has been dominated by white male voices, but also that feminist philosophy has too often taken white middle class women's experiences as the norm. And secondly, I thought Saria's paper really strongly foregrounded the way that motherhood operates as a site both of difference. So if we are willing to allow different women's experiences of mother to be heard and to reflect on how motherhood intersects with race, religion, class, ethnicity, for example, it, it operates as a site of difference, but also simultaneously as a site of solidarity. Um, so that insofar as women share experiences across culture, religion, social and ethnic differences, they can also find strength in shared experiences of limitation or oppression, shared strategies for dealing with it, and also through the realization I think that motherhood can be so very differently inhabited and multiply um, lived out. 
I think it's this position of motherhood as a kind of threshold between the personal and the political, the individual and the universal, the culturally specific and the cross-cultural, that make it such a powerful site of contestation and transformation. And that's also very apparent in Anna's paper that I haven't addressed directly here. So to tie this back, just to round up, and then I'll stop one more sentence. To tie this up more specifically to the question of the spiritual, which is our focus for today, if we think of spirit not perhaps on the traditional Western model as in opposition to body and matter, but as that which, as some other ways of thinking within the Western tradition also allow, if we think of spirit as that which is able to pass between bodies or traverse materialities, and we think of motherhood as a kind of threshold between both mother and child, but also the personal and the political, nature and culture, ethnicities and generations, for example, then I think it could be suggested that motherhood is a privileged site of the spiritual as this power of passing between and a potentially transformative power of passing between. And I think it's that transformative potential that all these papers point towards. Thank you. seems almost ironic that in 
and in the Daily's paper that these women who think they're reacting against conventional religion and um, getting away from it seem to me to be just doing exactly the same thing instead of saying that sacralized motherhood for its um, Judeo-Christian Islamic qualities, we say let's sacralize it because of our bodies or menstruation, but we're still sacralizing it. And the question I keep asking myself is that's being used as a ploy by patriarchy to keep us docile and keep us indoors and tell us we're really important, but you know, stay indoors and do your really, really important job um, and to stay out of the public sphere, therefore. And then when feminists appropriate that, are we trapping ourselves or are we really managing to turn it upside down and do something productive with it? And that's what I come up with. Mm -hmm. I don't think I'm asking my question, but I'm asking my question, <laughs> maybe. Um, well, on that, um, when it came to what Muslim women were telling me and their narratives, they seemed to make um, a difference between the religion on the one hand, that especially those women who, who had engaged with the text and who knew the text, they, they made a distinction between religion on the one hand, which was fairly decent, which was, you know, God isn't male or female, God has female attributes, God has male attributes. So they understood things like this. But they spoke about culture as being very patriarchal, and as an anthropologist, I know how um, difficult a distinction that is between religion and culture. But I still have to make it because that's what the women told me. They said religion is all right, and even I know religion is all right. God sets a decent precedent for women. But then you come to culture, particularly in Muslim communities, that is over overridden with, 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 with patriarchy. That's where the difficulty lies. So they challenged patriarchy and, and patriarchy sacralization. But they said if you look at how mothers are portrayed in the text and we reclaim that for ourselves, it can be more empowering. But it's a difficult balancing act, I agree. Yeah, um, my response is very similar to yours, Abigail. I feel that but I appreciate um, this alternative reading of motherhood, one that focuses on the transformative and generative aspect of it, um, and which takes us away from this tendency that we have, I think, in motherhood studies to look at how oppressive um, motherhood can be. <clears throat> I, I do feel it's, it's um, problematic. And you point out one of the, the, the problems. The other for me is um, where is the space for ambivalence in the sacralization of, of, of motherhood? Um, and you know, Rosika Parker tells us that mother that ambivalence is, is not only inevitable but also desirable. And I, and I just, from listening to the papers, couldn't see the space for ambivalence um, in in, the, in this kind of approach or sacralization of um, of motherhood. I mean, I thought Sharon's mm -hmm. yeah. 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 strong yeah. that motherhood is a side of a profound yes. and, and I agree that one of that, that there are real I think real risks in mm -hmm. the fact that there is um God of spirituality mm -hmm. you know, um, mm -hmm. that Anna was at outlining. Partly because <laughs> that ambivalence that, that you brought out so, so well gets, gets mm. lost and covered over. So I think, I think there are quite deep differences between the different approaches mm. in, 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 in that as well. And, and the, the women whose responses you brought out also. I suppose what I wanted to bring out in relation to Sharon and Surya is, is precisely actually that it seemed to me that their approaches were about living with ambiguity and not thinking of it as necessarily negative or destructive, mm -hmm. but in a sort of sight of yeah. process and, and relationality. And, and that doesn't mean it's always great and wonderful and joyous, but it's, mm -hmm. but it's kind of it's where relations, personal, ethical, political, get, get worked work through. Mm -hmm. I think the the, it's a shame I'm not here because I think that in some ways, the, for me, the, the, the goddess there chatting off is the most problematic yeah. Mm -hmm. for reasons others have raised. Though even there, I think there are resources in terms of. I think there are, there are real risks there, but some of the parts that I think were most interesting was the alignment of that movement with a kind of anti capitalist movement and an anti consumerist movement and, and, and an environmental movement. And it does so at the risk of reinforcing certain images of women. I, I agree with that. But there are maybe things there that can be called out politically. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm.
by using her husband's body, even when he doesn't intend that to happen. Mm -hmm. and, I, and I thought that was really, I mean, incredibly shocking, but very exciting. And it does seem it's not very explicit in the text, but the, when when she thinks about him in a sexual way after his um, disablement, there's this. It's also a sort of like maternal aspiration that comes from maternal aspiration that is that is latent in her thoughts, and that you know. I think that is, that's really interesting. <laughs> I thought you were going to say the story was. Yeah, well, when, yeah, that's that's I, well, when I was reading it, that's what I thought the story was going to be as well, and then it kind of isn't, but yeah. I, don't know, I don't know if the author, you know, what was going, where she's going. Have we got another question? Let's take one more, and then we're meant to be done. I um, just have one to um, just have some um, question about is it possible that uh, you know, the relationship between motherhood and religion, uh, or this, the same women, the same religion, it changes when you change your social context? For example, the Muslim women that you interviewed, have they lived in a society which allows them less choice about their career, about their social, um, mm -hmm. will their reaction to motherhood and what religion, uh, what religious teaching teaches? mean for them to become mothers change. I ask this question particularly because uh, marriage into a Muslim family in India, yeah. I see the same uh, women who uh, sisters, uh, one sister has stayed back in India and she sees her motherhood sometimes as something which really does not permit her social liberty. Whereas the other sister has come to the UK or you know, in some other country, because she has no choice, yet. she leaves her religious experiences. Um, is it that you know that religion and motherhood not only in the make it changes depending on your social context? Oh, uh, even for men, I mean yes. the same man sees yeah. a different you know, when he's in India. For example, this quotation which you did from the mother comes out to Allah. Um, it's very rarely quoted in India by men, but when you come to the UK, I was surprised to hear it because yeah. I did not, you know, I was not brought up in a Muslim family, but I got married into one, and I never heard the men quoting it. But back in UK, I heard it, yeah. and I was surprised that such a thing exists. No, oh, absolutely. I think that's you know, bang on that question. It's right in the, you know, it's right at the center of a lot of things that I'm trying to do. Um, and, and you know, if you go back to classical Islamic theology, you know, it was very much about the Arabic terms of urf and ada or, or customs and habits that you contextualize into theology. And, and that is one reason why everywhere I go, I, I argue for uh, a British Muslim, uh, a hybrid British Muslim identity and a British Islam that is inherently, you know, British in terms of values because no matter what cultural, religious, non-religious paradigm you come from, there are shared values. And these seem to, um, particularly when it comes to the narratives of young British Muslim women, there are so many things around emancipation and, and freedoms that you hear here and that women acknowledge. So for example, I have women from Pakistan and Iran come and tell me that, you know, actually living here in Britain, we've got more opportunities than possibly our mothers and, and grandmothers have in terms of education in the faith. Because, I mean, <laughs> this is coming out from academics working with Muslim women across the world. So American uh, anthropologists working with Muslim women and as Australian anthropologists and, and people like me here in Britain are talking about how faith, particularly for Muslim women, is becoming this sort of feminist tool where they, where they, where they, where they can challenge patriarchy. And coming back to you know what you said, people quote. So for example, I have actually heard that famous hadith being quoted in India and in, and, and in India, but it's in a completely different light, and that goes back to the ambiguity as well within this category. But even something that's relatively straightforward in the text. Um, about mother being the most blah blah, the most uh, important role of a woman. I mean, it can be read as the most important uh, role of a, of a woman, but I think the correct reading as a feminist living here, and also what feminist scholars say here, one of the most important roles. And I think what happens in India is, or in countries where there are more traditional understandings of faith, and that can happen here 
in, in communities in Britain as well, that it is read as the only rule, the be all and the end all. And in the end, in practice, it can become limiting for women. But again, when women, when women choose to interpret these, these things for themselves, um, that's where it changes. But it is ambiguous, and it is a long process of, of reclamation and, and re-looking and reinterpreting the faith. Thank you. Thank you. That sounds like a very conclusive note. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you, everybody. And uh, have a cup of coffee. Jill's going to tell us what rooms we have to go to, though.